Okay, so uh, good afternoon to all of you. So uh, you can see the topic of my talk today. So basically, it's going to be in two parts. So I'm talking about uh, two separate problems, which uh, uh, I worked on. So the first one is uh, on prototype selection. And the second one is on multi-label classification. And uh, so um, I'll start with the, the first uh, prototype selection. So uh, prototype selection basically is, uh, you know, when in, in the case of supervised learning, when we have a training data and uh, the training data is really large. So when the training data is large, uh, either the features are large or the number of instances are large. Uh, then for some type of classification, for example, things like nearest neighbor, etc., you find that, uh, you know, the, the process of uh, classification gets delayed. Okay? So the classification time actually gets delayed. So uh, to take care of this, we carry out this uh, prototype selection, basically. So, um, so if we look at prototype selection, so prototype selection basically is a condensation algorithm where uh, you're trying to take the training set itself and remove some of the examples you have so that you have a smaller training set with which to work with. So uh, the criteria here obviously is that the classification accuracy or the performance of your data shouldn't suffer. So you must try to uh, see that the performance doesn't drop. So um, one thing is if there are redundant examples, okay, then it's likely to not change the classification accuracy. But otherwise, you may find a drop in the classification accuracy. So if uh, in some cases, if the data is too large and you don't mind that drop, little drop in your accuracy, then you can also carry out this prototype selection. So basically, um, how, the, uh, how it helps is that it gives you faster classification and the reduction in the space that you require for the data. Because... Um, in the type of uh, algorithms I'm talking about, you need to store the entire data and use it at the time of classification. So uh, these are the two things which we, we see here. So if we have a training data key where you have a set of, say, n patterns where uh, you're given the class labels of those patterns, then prototype selection basically reduces the Size. So it's a subset of T, okay, where uh, if you have K patterns, you have K which is sort of less than N, basically. So this is uh, what we are doing in prototype selection. So prototype selection or uh, condensation algorithms, there are a whole lot of algorithms available, but I will only talk about the algorithms on which I have worked and, and given results. So, uh, okay, so, so the first one is the very popular CNN algorithm, okay, that is not conv convolution neural network, but condensed nearest neighbor algorithm, right? So, in the condensed nearest neighbor algorithm, it's a very simple uh, uh, algorithm where you have two sets. The, you have the training set T and the condensed set S. And so you take one point from T and add it into S, which is the condensed set. Then you classify all the other points in T. And at every step, uh, that is, you find the nearest neighbor in S of that pattern. And if that has a different label, then you add that on to your condensed set. Otherwise, you leave it out, right? So you do that, and and uh, you keep repeating this iteratively a number of times, till you find that there are no patterns which are misclassified by S. So basically, finally, 
you find that um, everything in T is classified correctly by S using this algorithm. The problem with this algorithm basically is that it is a order dependent algorithm. So, which means that if you change the order in which you uh, give the data to your algorithm, you'll find a different condensed set. So, the uh, point is which one is the optimal set? Okay, so you don't know which is the optimal set. So, that's the problem with this. Uh, so, then uh, we talk about this MCNN algorithm, which is actually a order independent algorithm. So, basically what we are doing here is dividing the entire region of interest into non-intersecting Voronoi partitions. And from each of them, you have one uh, pattern which is taken into the condensed set. Okay. So, this is done in an incremental fashion uh, using the uh, training data that we have. Um, so, what happens here is that uh, this algorithm is, uh, you know, sort of order independent algorithm and is giving uh, uh, much better results than your the CNN algorithm. But uh, the thing is that it is an algorithm which takes more time. Okay, so it takes a longer time than the CNN algorithm. The um, the thing is, uh, since it is a sort of offline algorithm, you can you know just do the um, algorithm once, right, get the condensed set and then use it. So, yeah. So, this algorithm is only to condense the data, right? So, Right, you use the same distance metrics like Euclidean distance or whatever you are using, right? Yeah. So the classification algorithm, like I said, is uh, allied to the new nearest neighbor type of algorithm. Okay, basically. So, uh, it takes a longer time, but it gives a better uh, uh, data set. So, coming to the actual algorithm, what we are, uh, uh, what, what is being done here is that you take each class and you find one representative pattern from each class and put it into the condensed set. So, the representative pattern could be the centroid or medoid, which is the, so the, like something like a middle pattern, etc. Right? So you could use any of those. So um, once you put that, you use S to classify T again, and uh, you get a set of misclassified samples from each class. So you use those misclassified samples to find the typical pattern again, which is added on to S again. And then the new set S is again used to classify T and you keep doing this for a number of iterations and uh, just like in the CNN algorithm, you will find that finally all the samples in T will be classified correctly by S. Okay, So, this is the MCNN algorithm and this is an order independent algorithm because it does not matter in what, what order you give the data. Okay, So, you are going to get the same result. So we are, uh, so basically uh, what I am doing is I am trying to do prototype selection for like something like streaming data. Okay, so um, the idea is that um, the training data is not a stationary data. So what happens is you keep getting samples into the training data. So whenever you get new samples, obviously the the condensed set is going to change. Okay, so, so the prototypes that you have is going to change. So when we talk about uh, streaming data, the idea is that even if you take something like clustering, 
Okay, so um, so you have a set of data and you have found the clusters for that data. Now, whenever a new pattern comes into the training data, your clustering is going to change. Okay, so it doesn't make sense to do the clustering all over again from scratch. So the idea is, how do you take care of it in an incremental fashion? So that's the idea of the streaming algorithms, which I, which we are talking about here. So here, uh, when, when I'm talking about prototype selection, so as the streaming data comes in, your set of prototypes will, will change. So how do you take care of that? So that is what has been handled over here. So this is the MCNN algorithm. I'm not going to go into it. I'll just leave it at that. So I come to the streaming data. So this uh, uh, streaming data, we consider, uh, first of all, that we have a small chunk of data samples at the beginning for which we find the initial prototypes. And I'm going to uh, talk about two methods which we are using for this part. And um, the, the first part actually requires your initial prototype set or this chunk of data that you are having over here to be somewhat representative in some way, okay? So what you're uh, uh, doing here is that you find the prototypes for this. And uh, as the remaining data comes in one by one, you're just going to check with the uh, samples you have here, okay? If uh, these are cl classified correctly or uh, if the closest neighbor has the same uh, class label or not. If it doesn't, then you include that into your uh, set. Okay, so this is a simple thing, but uh, not really uh, that effective because you may find that uh, more number of samples are there. So this is the first method which we talk about. Okay, so where um, um, so you have the condensed set as S, and then for R, you are going to find the uh, closest uh, neighbor and then you're going to add it on. So let me talk about the second method. So the second method, the first phase is the same. So you, you have a chunk of data which you're going to start off with. And the only thing with that, which that chunk of data has to uh, uh, satisfy is that it should have at least one sample of every class. So that is the only thing that should be satisfied there. Then you have the data streams. So as the data points come in, you wait for some L samples, okay, to, to be there. And uh, before that, you just keep these extra points along with the chunk of data which you already have as part of the condensed set, okay? So once you get L patterns, you, you are going to classify those L patterns using the MCNN algorithm. So you're going back into that and uh, you're trying to see which are the misclassified samples among this L. And then we are using the MCNN algorithm here to do it this in an iterative way and add uh, samples, okay? So again, uh, you're finding the uh, misclassified samples and, and one centroid from each class and adding it to it, etc. okay? So you do that and then you take the next set of L patterns when they come. So what you find is that this takes longer than the method one because we are using MCNN on this part of the algorithm, but it gives a smaller condensed set over here, okay? So these are the two methods and again, I'll not go into this, okay? So, um, so this uh, gives you the pr procedure that we have used for uh, taking care of streaming data. You can also use the same algorithm for very large data. So what you do is that you start off with a small chunk of data, and then the rest of it you divide into blocks, okay? And you can use those blocks, one block at a time, and, uh, you know, get the result. So uh, the next uh, thing we did was the parallelization of this MCNN algorithm. So. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that is not a concern because we just uh, 
uh, consider it one at a time. So as it comes, the type of thing. Uh, you, you, I mean, the, the, you can look at it either way, but we are using it only once. Okay, so uh, it's something like uh, like a one pass thing. Okay, so we don't use the data again. As it comes, you, we use the data basically. Okay, so uh, so in parallelization, what we have basically done is we have divided the training set into equally sized disjoint training sets which are given to the various processors that we have and we have one uh, processor which is called the root processor okay so the root processor handles the task of division of uh, uh, you know the patterns into the various processors and gathering all the information etc so we are uh, making use of the root node for that so each node has its own training set. So it's a subset of the complete training set. And it computes the condensed set in parallel by using this, right? So, so here uh, the root node will partition and then each uh, processor calculates the sum of the elements of each class okay, in that processor and the number of elements and sends this back to the root node. So the root node combines all these things, calculates the typical pattern or the centroid and sends it back to the processors. And the processors will find the closest points um, for, for every class in that particular training set which it has and sends it back to the main processor. And the main processor will find the closest point for every class using this. So, so that actually gives you the centroid or the medoid like we say okay so what we are trying to find is something like a middle point for all the patterns so what we are using is uh, actually not the centroid but the medoid so so one way of getting the medoid is finding the closest point to the centroid which is in your training data so that is what we have done here okay then this is sent back to the processors and it is added on to the condensed set which is already there etc and then the misclassified samples are found and the steps uh, which I had given earlier will be repeated on these misclassified samples you, so you keep doing that and then uh, finally the root node will collect all the uh, prototypes and form the final condensed set so uh, we use the map reduce for doing uh, this uh, Thing. So this gives a sort of uh, graphical picture of what was done over here, right? So, okay, so, so the coming to the results that we got for this, so what we uh, have got is they have used on, on five data sets. So these are the Data sets. Some of them are not that big, but anyway, uh, now some of them have large number of features, etc. So then this actually gives you without condensation. Okay, so obviously this is giving you the best result over here. And these are the condensation algorithms which we have tried. And this is the method one, method two, which we have used. And you can see that the results are sort of comparable with whatever you have got with these. So this, when we say that we have used the CNN, MCNN, etc., this condensation is done on the entire data. Okay, so it's uh, not done in the streaming fashion like we did in method one and method two. So these are comparing well with these uh, results, basically. This one? No, actually, that's a comma. <laughs> Okay, so this gives you the accuracy and we can see that uh, the first one is, is high because that is with the entire set of samples and the others are somewhat comparable in all the methods. So including the last two. So the last two are the method one, method two, which we have actually used here. 
and here actually this gives the entire result but i just like to show you the execution time over here so this is the uh, okay if we take forest cover as the largest uh, data set that we have used so you find that uh, uh, the time taken so these are the time taken for method one method two is definitely much smaller than the time for for all the others okay and we saw that the accuracy was also good right so that is uh, uh, the this part of it so um this is uh, gives the execution time and we can see that the last two are definitely taking much less time in all the cases basically so uh, this is the distributed algorithm so with different uh, processes it has been done and you find uh, the execution time sort of coming down depending on the number of processes that we have used so that is uh, so this actually these results are also on streaming data so we have used the algorithms on on streaming data and uh, using the parallel algorithm and these are the results that uh, i'm showing you on that so these are the two uh, publications which we have got out of this the first one is uh, on the parallel mcnn and the second one is on the large and streaming data the work on the large and streaming data yeah No, actually, the parallel does the same thing as the serial MCNN. There's no difference. Okay. No, you're not doing that. Basically, you're you're actually compare it to, comparing it to everything. Okay, it's just that. Um, each uh, node does it separately and that is that comes to the root node which combines these to get the overall picture okay so what we are doing in in parallel mcnn is the same as serial mcnn except that it's done in a parallel fashion you will get the same result mm. what i'm saying is that if we if we take a, a data set and if we run uh, a parallel mcnn on that and serial mcnn on that you'll get the same result okay that's what i mean okay so uh, now i will uh, come to the, the the next part where i'm talking about the multi label classification and uh, what uh, i have done here basically is to get a new algorithm for carrying out uh, multi label uh, classification which works only for discrete data basically so that is the first part and and uh, the second part is that the problem with my algorithm is that if the features are large then you find that uh, the you know uh, the uh, the size of your problem goes up a lot so what i have done is i have used method for feature selection in the multi label classification so that's the second part and the third part is the parallelization of this algorithm so these are the three things which have been done on this algorithm so when we are talking about uh, multi label classification so we have a set of labels and every pattern is mapped on to a subset of the labels that you have okay so not just one label but a number of labels okay so obviously um, this may be a problem which is a little different from our single label problem which we have been seeing all this time so when you have uh, multi labels you need to use different algorithms for carrying this out okay another thing is in multi label when you have a set of a subset of labels the order in which these labels 
a curve may also be important. So in other words, the first label may be the most important, the second label, etc. So the ordering of the labels is also important. So that is the multi-label ranking, which we are talking about. Okay, so I'll just go directly into the algorithm which I have carried out. So what I have basically done here is that I've assumed that each attribute has something like P discrete values here, right? So like I said, this works only on discrete values, the algorithm. Therefore, uh, suppose, uh, of course, this can be modified to make it a, a variable also. But for the sake of explanation, what I have taken is that each attribute has uh, p values which are available, right? Uh, and we have something like q classes which we have. So what we do is we consider an input matrix or, or a probability matrix M. So this actually will have as many rows as the number of classes that you have and the columns will be n into p so so for for each uh, uh, instance the i mean um, uh, for, for each uh, pattern or, or for each attribute okay so we consider there are n attributes so for each of the attributes it can take p value so n into p is the number of columns that we are considering there, okay? So uh, what we do is for every training instance, we need to update the entries in M, okay? So the corresponding entries. So suppose I take one instance and it has uh, some subset of uh, class labels. So in those uh, uh, rows, you are going to update the, the column which corresponds to that value in that attribute. So that uh, uh, is what is done here. And finally, once you finish uh, the, all the training instances, you're going to take each row of M and divide it by the number of instances of that class. So what you're getting is basically values between zero and one. And you can say that it gives you something like the fuzzy membership value of that attribute to that attribute value to the particular class. Okay, so that is the basic thing which you need to do. So we can see that we have an explicit training uh, phase over here, okay, with the data set that we have, okay. Um, so then when we get a test uh, instance, what you're doing is we are taking a vector n, okay. So n is a vector which has uh, got np rows and, and one column, okay. So it's a vector basically. And so first you uh, set all the values to zero and the locations in N which correspond to the particular attributes, not the classes really, but the particular attributes you're talking about, the value of that particular attribute, you change that those instances to one, okay? So we are going to get N which will represent this particular test sample. And so you multiply M and N and you get a vector P. So the vector P is going to have a Q uh, rows, okay? And each, uh, if you, uh, you know, uh, divide it by the maximum value that we have over there, then, uh, if you, uh, then what you're going to get is, you're going to get some type of um, fuzzy values between zero and one, right? So you'll find that uh, the one which has the maximum value will have a, uh, the the class which has you know the which has the maximum value in pi will be changed to one, okay, and the others will be values between zero and one, and you use some type of a threshold over there, okay. So we use a, a threshold here and anything which gets a value which is greater than this threshold, okay, you say it belongs, this test pattern belongs to that class. So this is uh, the method and depending on the values you have, you can rank these. 
and say say which is the first uh, label, which is the second label, etc. Okay, so this is the uh, method that we are talking about. So we can see here that uh, since your M matrix has n into p uh, columns, it's it's going to be very large, especially if your number of features sort of increases, right? So what uh, uh, we decided is that we'll carry out feature selection on this to reduce the complexity of that, right? Okay, uh, another problem is the that you find that uh, most of the attributes like uh, most of the attributes are continuous, like you know, you can't say everything is discrete. Okay, so uh, and uh, you can also have data sets where some of the features, some of the attributes are continuous and some of them are discrete, etc. So what we uh, did was we did a discretization of the continuous attributes. So um, so if um, attribute is um, continuous, we decided how many um, you know uh, partitions we want to have of that. So so if you want to have something like say k intervals, you divide it into k minus you you find k minus one points at which to cut this and. Uh, so there are two types of um, discretization you can do here. Uh, one is the uh, one is the uh, unsupervised one where you just take the entire range and divide it equally sized. Okay. The second one is supervised where you take the class labels of the attributes also into account when you're going to divide the sub, divide the range. So what we have used is something like some key means uh, clustering to, uh, you know, divide up uh, this thing. So so basically, uh, by doing this, we are saying that we can use this algorithm for any data set. Okay, not necessarily that it has to be only discrete values. Okay, because you may not always have discrete values available to you. Um, so uh, now if we come to uh, the multi-label classification, obviously we can't use the same metrics which we are using in the case of the single label. So in the single label, we use things like uh, accuracy, etc. But here what you have is a, a subset of labels, not just one label, right? And also the order of the labels are also important. So you need to have other evaluation metrics over here. So these are some of the evaluation metrics used. The first one is what is called the Hamming laws. So it is the number of times a wrong label is predicted or a label belonging to a pattern is not predicted. Okay. So you, you see that for every pattern, every test pattern and you average it, average it out. Okay. So it finds a symmetric difference between this is the predicted labels. And this is the actual label. So it finds a symmetric difference and finds edge loss. Okay, so this is Hamming distance. And we can say that um, the smaller this value is, the better it is, right? Because you want, um, uh, I mean, if it, if it is perfect, then it's going to be zero. Okay, Hamming loss will be zero, basically. Uh, so next is one error. So one error is only the top ranked label. So you check how many times the top rank label uh, is not predicted correctly, right? So when it is when it is not predicted, you are adding all those up, and obviously this also the value should be zero is the best, and the smaller it is, the better. Then we come to ranking loss. So ranking loss is the average fraction of label pairs that are misordered, okay, for the object. So you see the predicted one and actual one and take all the pairs and see uh, in, 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 uh, how many of them are not ordered correctly and you are using this. Okay? So actually this also you can say that the smaller it is the better. Then we come to precision. So average precision evaluates average fraction of proper label ranked above a particular label Y. Okay, so this average precision should be, of course, as high as possible. Okay, 
Then we come to coverage. So coverage says it's evaluates, it evaluates how far it is needed to go down the list of labels to cover all the labels of the object. Okay. So the labels that you have predicted, you uh, how many uh, of those do you have to go down? Okay. So obviously coverage also, the smaller it is, the better, basically. Okay. So this is uh, our um, um, Hamming loss, one error, etc. So this uh, arrow shows that the smaller it is, the better. And this uh, up arrow shows that the larger it is, the better. So we have, we have uh, actually um, compared it with multi-label KNN, which is a, a standard uh, multi-label algorithm. And you find that it's sort of, uh, in, in many cases, it's doing better. And there are one or two places here where the MLKNN is doing better, etc. So uh, this is two data sets which I have given. So this is one data set and this is the, another data set which we have considered. So you find that it is giving good uh, results, basically. Uh, Okay, so after that, we decided to carry out feature selection. So we used basically two methods of feature reduction. One is called MDDM, multi-label dimensionality uh, reduction via dependence maximization. So this is a specific uh, dimensionality reduction algorithm for multi-label uh, data. And the second one is the simulated annealing. So I will not uh, basically go into details of this. So MDMM tries to identify a lower dimensional space, uh, maximizing dependence between the features and the class label. And a simulated annealing is a probabilistic hill climbing procedure. Okay, so we are trying to find the optimum set of features by having an evaluation metric on a validation data. Okay, so I'd not go into these two algorithms, but they are feature selection. So SA actually is a feature selection. Simulated any link is used here as a, a feature selection algorithm. It could be used for anything, not necessarily multi-label. You could use it for even for single label data, etc. So these are the two which were used. And um, so this is the results that we are basically getting. Okay. So um, what you find is, of course, um, maybe uh, the MLKNN and proposed algorithm may be doing slightly better as compared to these two, but they are somewhat comparable. Okay? And there are also cases where, you know, the uh, feature reduction is doing better uh, than uh, in the case of uh, these two. Okay? So this reduction really helps, um, especially in the uh, case of very large data or if you have many features so if you're um, sorry, if you have many attributes, okay, then yeah, many features. That's, that's right. So this is the same result. So this actually brings out uh, this type of thing where uh, you know the coverage here is becoming very high. This is MLKNN. So there are cases where MLKNN KNN is doing really badly. So those are uh, some things which uh, this thing brings out. So how did we parallelize, parallelize this algorithm? So we basically parallelized only two steps in this. The first one is the feature selection. So when we parallelized it, we used only the feature score over there. Okay. So the feature score uh, is calculated from your training data. Okay. So this is the um, equation to find the feature score for a particular feature. And this is done in parallel, basically. Okay, so you have a number of processes which are doing this uh, feature score calculation in parallel. Another thing is the training phase. So we can see that the training phase of the algorithm is just the updation of the M matrix. And this can definitely be parallelized very easily. So these are the two steps which we parallelized. And MapReduce was basically used here. Okay, so. Uh, what we did is we took for top 40% of the features. So the F score should be a higher F score is a better feature. 
So we use the top 40% of the features and left out the rest of the features for uh, doing this. And uh, so these are uh, the data sets that are uh, basically used here. So these are all the multi-label uh, data sets which we use. Okay. And uh, so this, uh, now this, this, I think something got left out in the middle. Okay, so so this is the time taken for the feature selection itself. So you, for the number of cores, as the number of cores increases, you find that uh, your time uh, required is uh, coming down. And this is the time required for the training phase. That is, uh, what we are uh, trying to show here is that um, before feature selection and after feature selection, there was a lot of difference in the time taken for this uh, thing. Um, so this gives you the classification time. So this gives you the classification uh, time for, uh, actually as the number of cores are, are increasing. And this is uh, before feature selection and this is after feature selection. So these are uh, shown for different data sets over here. Um, and this actually is a comparison of Hamming laws that is before feature selection or after feature selection. We know that this should be as uh, small as possible, but uh, you find that, you know, uh, after feature selection also the Hamming laws is almost uh, the same in uh, these cases. Same, uh, um, this is one error. So again, you can see that there's no, uh, by carrying out feature selection, you're not really losing anything much out there. So these are the three uh, um, uh, publications which we have on uh, this uh, work. So the first one is just the classification on discrete data. Second one is the feature reduction. And the third one is the parallelization. So. Yeah, so, so these are the two methods which I uh, wanted to uh, basically discuss today. And these are the conclusions. Okay, so we can say that parallelization of, of both the algorithms gave uh, quite a lot of saving. And uh, um, so one more thing about the prototype selection is that if you can use it even for large data sets by dividing it into blocks. So the same algorithm can be used there by adding a block at a time. And um, we, we also showed how attributes, continuous attributes can be discretized before using this algorithm. And uh, because of the uh, large size of your M matrix, et cetera, we tried to carry out feature selection and parallelization which gave a uh, much better uh, timing as compared to the earlier case. That's it. Yeah. Multi-label? Uh, it's uh, like each uh, instance uh, doesn't have a single label, but it has a number of labels. Okay, for example, if you take um, something like, uh, you know, news, news items, etc. What you find is uh, uh, the, the same news item may have, may belong to both politics as well as uh, entertainment or uh, sports and entertainment, etc. Or if you take an image, they, if you take uh, the class labels as you know, a river and mountains, etc. So the same um, uh, instance can have more than one class label. So th that is the uh, problem which we are trying to address here. Basically. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, actually, by uh, uh, updating that M matrix, we are considering only those where uh, which are updated, right? The values. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so uh, we have used a validation set, basically. Okay, so we have used a validation set, used different thresholds, and found the best uh, threshold. Okay, so the... Either exhaustive search, or you can do some other type of search, right? Some type of binary search or something, right? So, so basically, we have just tried some experimentation and found the best threshold. So we are using that threshold. 